afternoon. This is Julia Whittup with Talk Story TV, and we have with us today Barbara Bruner, who is going to tell us about her new book, Dogma. And go ahead, Barbara, tell us about Dogma. Dogma, the Zen of Slobber, is a book that I started writing in my head about 20 years ago. Um, it's a story of my life with my dogs, uh, nine of them. Uh, they were all rescue dogs of some variety. Some came from very bad lives. Some just came out of interesting circumstances. Uh, and we have some very, very funny stories to tell throughout the course of those years. Um, and it's just been a real pleasure to, to um, tell the stories and, and share it with people that the 17 moves around the country that I've made, the dogs that we've had that we've picked up along the way, and our adventures. <laughs> that sounds interesting. And uh, what are the, what's the biggest thing you learned to, about dogs taking care of dogs? Well, dogs really add so much to your life. They really um, they, they add um, a soul to your life and um, can contribute so much, I think, to the, the human experience. Um, they, they have unconditional love. They, they give without taking. Um, and I think people could, could learn a lot from listening to, to animals, not even just dogs specific, but animals as a, as a group. And so did you volunteer at the pound or something, or how did you happen to start uh, taking dogs in? Well, we first started with our very first dog um, that was the puppy of a young lady that worked for me. Uh, her dog had an unexpected litter of puppies, and we took one in. Um, from there, it, it grew into needing a second dog to keep the first dog company. We went to a rescue in order to find that dog, which is a very funny tale in itself. Um, and through that, we realized how many dogs were in rescues. When, when we went into this, it was the Los Angeles Doberman Rescue Society. And there were hundreds of dogs that needed homes. And it, it was so sad. And it was just, it's awful to think of how many animals end up in places like that. And nobody wants them. Um, and we found a, a wonderful second dog who became a part of our family. And our story grew from there. Mm -hmm. um, then I started volunteering at um, rescue societies and shelters and the Humane Society. And as we moved around the country, uh, you know, different, different societies and, and places got um, got me involved in what they were doing, whether it was for fundraising or to clean out dog runs. I, I, I was so flexible to do anything just to help animals. Oh, <laughs> and so how did, is nine the most dogs you've ever had? You said you have nine dogs. We had nine dogs over the course of 32 years. The most we ever had at one time was five, and that was insane. Uh, we were living in Portland, Oregon. We had a pretty big piece of property, and we had the space and room and, and the time to devote to them. So it, it worked out okay, but it got a little chaotic sometimes. Uh, they were all big dogs except for a little terrier. So uh -huh. Okay. I have three, so I'm thinking that's a big enough pack for me. <laughs> oh, it is. Five gets challenging. <laughs> but so. Caesar Milan is my hero. Yes, yes, he's, he's got it figured out. <laughs> so tell us some of the funny stories about your dogs. Well, we, we've had some real interesting things through the years. Um, our, our worst dog ever was Madison, and she was a lab Dalmatian mix that was adopted out of a box in front of Walmart. Um, and she was the very last puppy to go. She was very vocal, very loud. And um, all, all of, I think all of her personality came out in that voice. We could never really shut her up. Um, and she did some crazy things through the years. She was an escape artist. She learned how to open the, the locks of kennel doors and, and uh, room doors. She could open doorknobs. Um, she could open the refrigerator. Um, oh, no. She was really quite a handful. <laughs> quite a handful. But adorable nonetheless. So the kennel? She, she could she open the kennel? A good part of the book. She could open the kennel door. She could open a flip latch. She could open a hoop latch. And she could open a bolt um, tumbler latch. 
Um, it didn't take her much time at all. So there, there were times when we would board her. Uh, if we had to travel or be out of town on business, we, we would board her at our veterinarian. And um, they ended up having to put a padlock on her cage to keep her in because they would come in in the morning and all of, it, all of the cages would be open and the dogs were running loose for the whole kennel because she would let herself out and she would let everybody else out. Oh, so, my goodness. As the, we, we never knew this until we were getting ready to move from Nashville and went in to say goodbye to our vet and pick up our records and, um, you know, talk to them a little bit. And they showed us the padlock and said they could, they could you know, retire it that day. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And they told us the story of her letting the dogs out, and they just never wanted to tell us and, and bother us with it, but it, it was fairly well known to them. And they nicknamed her Houdini in a dog suit. I started that to say that. Name. You should have named her Houdini. <laughs> Do you, that was her nickname, Houdini in a dog suit. So when, we, when we moved from Nashville to um, Seattle that time, uh, we were going to put her in boarding, a board and train facility for a couple of weeks, just while we got settled and to give her a little bit of discipline, which she really could have benefited from. <laughs> uh, and the kennel person came and picked her up, took her to the back, um, and we're explaining to the girl at the front desk, don't, don't put her in a regular cage. Here, you need to use this padlock. You need to put it on her crate. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. We're very, very safe, very secure. She will not get out. And as she was saying that, Madison bolted past us. She had already gotten out of her, out of her kennel and was running out into the parking lot. <laughs> she was right. So, oh, no. So she was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And tell us about Gus. Yes, yeah, it was a wonderful dog. Um, if I could actually read a little bit from the book about him, I, I would okay, love to do that. Okay, that would be great. Um, it's, it's a real fun little story that um, uh, when Gus actually came to live with us, he um, was wandering. He, we, we found him. He wandered into our yard one day, and he ended up just staying with us. So this is the story of how he came to be living with us. And we called him White Dog. After White Dog had been living with us full-time for over a month, a car pulled into our driveway. A man got out, grabbed White Dog, put a rope around his neck, and started dragging him down to his car. I ran out in a panic. What are you doing? You can't take my dog. And his response was, hey, lady, he's my dog. Look at his collar. I've got his name written on it. His name is Gus. The collar came off, and of course there was nothing written on it, but he seemed convinced that White Dog belonged to him. The dog did respond to the name Gus. He said without any hesitation, we remembered we hadn't fed him in a while, so we thought we'd better go looking for him. Oh, I said, what? Oh. White Dog had been with us for two months. Two months. Two months. They remember they hadn't fed him. Two months. Who are these people? <laughs> two months. <laughs> two months. Two months. These are valid dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As we talked, we discovered Gus, our super Augustus to the American Kennel Club, was a Brittany from Champion stock. He was a wedding present to these folks. I'll call them Dick and Jane to keep them anonymous. Jane didn't like Gus. When they had a baby, Gus was relegated to an outdoor kennel. This kennel, as we came to learn, had no doghouse, no shade. It was just a concrete pad with a chain link fence. Good grief. This was Nashville. The temperature reached 105 degrees in the summer and 20 in the winter. He had no protection from the elements. Gus had learned to escape from the chain link fence to hunt for food and water. Then out of loyalty, always returned home at night. Dick worked for the IRS. Jane was a surgeon. These were educated people. It was disgusting. I told Dick we had come to love White Dog and would really be happy to keep him if he was too much trouble for them. He said no. He really loved Gus, too, and thanked me for the offer. I was in tears, and I ran inside to call Ray. They took White Dog, I will, and recounted to Ray the story. And he did what any rational businessman would do. Call them. Start offering them money. At some point, they'll say yes. It's exactly what I did. I found their phone number and called. Jane answered. Before I could even get the words out of my mouth that we would buy him, she said, if you want him, we'll bring him right over. He's yours. Five minutes oh. passed and they drove down the driveway. Dick opened the car door. Gus took off like a shot directly to the dog door on the opposite side of the house. He was sitting in the entry hall before Dick and Jane even got to the front door. He was home. I asked if they had his veterinary records, and they said there were none. Gus had never been to a vet. 
Oh, they told us now he belonged to us. And if there was anything wrong with him, they didn't want to hear it. Ironically, they also brought an unopened bag of dog food that we can't now pass by the bags of Old Roy at Walmart without chuckling and remembering Gus. Dick and Jane signed his AKC registration papers over to us, and Gus was now ours. He was three years old. Three years old, and you've never been to a vet? Never been to a vet. Living in the South where heartworm, and there are so many diseases, and they and she they was a doctor. Yes, it, it was really, really sad. And I hope someday they find this book and read it and realize that he ended up with a very wonderful life. Um, he lived to be 15 years old. He never left my side. He was my guardian constantly. Um, and he had a very good life. Very good life. Yeah. yeah. And you say, uh, you say in your um, introduction to, to me that you met a pet psychic. Can oh, gosh. It, about that? it was so, so funny. Um, there's a, a wonderful section in the book. I won't read right now to bore you with it, but I will give you the synopsis. Um, Gus had food allergies that we didn't know about, um, and it caused him to have epileptic seizures. Um, through a long course of trying to figure out what was wrong with him before we knew that it was a preservative in dog food that was actually causing the epileptic seizures, I talked to everybody about it. I, I, anybody I could find on the street talked to him about my dog and what was happening. Somebody told me about a pet psychic, and I was a bit skeptical. I, you know, I, I just wasn't quite sure about that. But I made an appointment. I thought, what could it hurt? Um, so I called her, and at the appointed time, called, had Gus in the room with me, and she started to tell me what she was sensing from him, that he had been struck in the head by a, a bright light, which she thought mm, could be a thunderbolt, could be gunfire. She wasn't really sure. I thought... It, he's a hunting dog. That's not that's not a stretch. Okay, you know I I could see her coming up with that mm -hmm. without any information from me. So we continued to talk, and um, she said that she also sensed from him that uh, he had been hit on the head by a very ghoulish woman um, for eating wallpaper off of a wall. And it was very funny because we had met Dick and Jane and talked to them. Um, they said that was the first reason they put him outside because he tore the wallpaper off the wall of their bathroom, oh. which I thought was rather intriguing. So we ended up our conversation and she said, I, I don't know if this has any relevance or not, but um, you really should think about changing his food. He has a stomach ache and he would like for you to change his food. And as it turns out later we found out he had this preservative allergy that was causing epilepsy and all it took was a change of food to make him feel better. So I thought that was interesting. So as I was getting ready to hang up the phone with her, um, finish our, our conversation, because we had a, a set period of time, she said, uh, wait, there's someone that still wants to talk to me. And I'm like, no, there's no one else here. And she said, no, do you have another dog in the house? And I said, well, yeah, I do, they're not in the room, but I have three other dogs in the house. And she said, one of them keeps calling me, me, me. And said, oh, okay, you know, a little crazy, but I don't fight. What, you know, what is it? And she said, well, this, this particular dog, I'm getting an image of a hamburger and a very, very happy dog with a hamburger. But she's saying, please ask them to not get any pickles on my hamburger anymore, which I was just completely dumbfounded by because one of our dogs loved to go through the drive-thru drive -thru at McDonald's <laughs> and get a burger and always spit out the pickles every single time she spit out the pickles. So it was an interesting story. <laughs> interesting story. That's interesting. She still don't know if I believe in pet psychics, but it was certainly an interesting experience for me. And changing the dog food made the epilepsy go away, so... It, it did. I, I, there, there was something there. So I, I think it's, a, it's wonderful that what she sensed worked. How she did it, I don't know, but it was wonderful. It truly was. And you... And you also had a dog that discovered cancer. Yes, yes, I did. Um, his name was Cooper. He was a, um, a Doberman who was going to be put to death when he was born because he had pink nose and blue eyes and um, was not a show quality dog, which was really rather tragic and sad. Um, we found out about it. We adopted him and brought him into our home when he was only six weeks old. 
Um, I, uh, as an adult, as he grew up, a couple of years old, he started to jump up on my chest and bounce off like he was um, uh, playing tag. I, I can't think of a better way to describe it, but he hit the same spot every single time. He would bounce off and then go running. Um, that, that spot that he would hit bruised and eventually got a little lump under it, so I went to the doctor to see what she thought. And she said, ah, oh, it's nothing, nothing at all to worry about. Don't, don't worry. We'll just go in. We'll, we'll nip it out. It'll just be a quick little outpatient procedure, and then it won't come up on a mammogram. That you won't have to worry about it. Um, so I, I went in for the surgery. I was supposed to be out within 15 minutes. And when they put me under anesthesia, I went out immediately, and then I remember waking up in the operating room saying, ouch. And I, I felt a tremendous amount of pain, and I heard the doctor say, oh, my God, what is that? And underneath the cyst that had formed from Cooper jumping on me was a three-centimeter cancerous tumor. Uh, had he not jumped on me, I never would have known it was there until it was too late. So I truly believe he saved my life. Wow. It uh, was a very, very touching story. So he, he was my hero. I saved him, and then he saved me. <laughs> well, these are. This is a remarkable story about all your dogs and your life. How did you happen to decide to write about it? I started thinking about writing a book when we lost our very first dog, who was a Doberman named Kashi. She's the one who's pictured on the cover of the book. Um, she was lived to be seventeen, so she was really almost a child to us. Um, and Let's when she passed cover. away, can we see the cover? Can we see it? Oh, what up higher? That's her, huh? That's her. Okay. That's my sweetheart. Um, she. Uh, it was. It was very sad when we lost her. Even though she was. She was old at seventeen. Um, you know, she was. She was really quite a family member. And I started thinking, how can I? Um, sort of get all of these thoughts of mine together and, and sort of um, cherish them and, and, you know, get them down on paper. Other people might enjoy them. But I, I never had time. I owned a business. I was traveling all over the world. Um, I just had way too much to do. So they just kind of rattled around in my head for almost 20 years. Um, in 2009, my husband and I decided we were going to get out of the rat race and retire. We moved full-time to our vacation home that we had in Florida. Thank you. <laughs> and I had time to start writing my book. Um, and I sat down and started putting all my stories on paper. And within three months, I had my first draft. Wow. And uh, it was really, really fun. It was, I've never written a book. I don't understand how long these things take. Everybody says, three months? That's insane. But that was my first draft. That's the first one that went to the editor. Um, and uh, came back with a few changes, and we worked on that, and did some rewrites, and went back and forth, and here, here we are with the book. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> it was so, fun. It really was. I think because I had been thinking about the stories for so many years, they just sort of poured out. As, as, as they came through my head, they just sort of went onto paper. So, yeah. Are you going to write pleasure. any more books? Uh, yes, I will. I've already been getting asked for a sequel to this, which is a real life story, so we have to let it unfold a little bit. Um, but we now have two dogs. Our, our two remaining dogs are Morgan and Izzy. Morgan is a 120 pound Rottweiler, and Izzy is a 20 pound Terrier who thinks she rules the world. So her antics could, could fill a novel easily. <laughs> and that, that will definitely be the sequel at some point in time. And I, I've got a blog going. Um, we have a blog called um, Zen and a Blind Dog um, that I put little notes on periodically about what Izzy has done and, you know, what crazy story. She's blind, um, and we have a pool. We're in Florida, so she regularly falls into the pool or, you know, runs into something she shouldn't be running into. So there's, there's some fun stories. All right, I'm looking for. And where can we? Well, where is your blog? Could you tell us your blog address first? Uh, my blog address is um, Zen and a Blind Dog at Blogspot.com. Okay. And the book, 
the book is available um, on my website, which is dogmathebook.com, or it's available on Amazon, Kindle, Nook, iTunes, all, all, of, all of the regular players, um, in a physical book or in an e-book. All right. Well, we're looking forward to seeing your book, and very happy to have you on the show this morning. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure speaking with you. All right.